I'm Daniela Cracknell, a longtime workplace wellness advocate. I am filling in today for your host, Linda Crockett, so Linda can join a panel of her peers. So welcome to On the Record, a documentary series about the prevalence of workplace harassment, adult bullying, and discrimination that causes harm to employees and significant loss to employers. We go to work to work, not to be hurt, but in one's working life, you most likely will face a workplace offender, if not already. The more you know, the more you can spot and stop offenders before they harm you, your coworkers, and your place of employment. The damages are livelihoods lost and businesses destroyed. Not all at once, but these are the ripple effects. So when victims and witnesses speak up, another stands up, and then another finds their voice. In numbers, victims start to feel protected and safe to share their stories. Change then happens for the better. You will hear more voices today as we go on the record to shine a light on social workers. Social workers advocate for social justice and human dignity, but who advocates for them? We do. Together, our social workers take us into the front lines of high-risk, crisis-oriented mental health environments, courageously sharing first-hand accounts. We start with Linda as she tells you her story. Thank you, Daniela. My name is Linda Crockett. I am the founder of the Canadian Institute of Workplace Harassment and Violence. And I'm here today to, to share a little bit about my own story. I have been in my profession since the first day I started as a student for 34 years. And for about 22 years, I was in various different industries, but always got myself in trouble. I never knew what this dark cloud was that followed me. I just knew that I kept opening my mouth and saying, hey, you can't talk to people that way, or you can't treat people that way, or I refused to dance with my manager one, one evening at Christmas while we were all out at a pub to celebrate, and then all of a sudden things went downhill. Or I reported on an office manager for speaking very inappropriately and things went, went downhill. So I kept leaving the job thinking, I'll try this job and then I'll leave and I'll try this job and I would get in trouble and leave and do this job. Or I'd go back to school and get another degree or another certificate, keep thinking, I don't know what it is that's wrong with me, but I keep getting in trouble. It turned out at the 22 year mark of my career when I hit rock bottom that I realized that was bullying that I was going through. I was either being mobbed, I was either experiencing lateral violence, or I was witnessing bullying happen to somebody else. I just didn't know it. We social workers were not trained, and to this day, it's not mandatory in our training, and that's wrong. We're not trained to identify it, we're not trained to deal with it, and we must be. And that's been my mission for the last 11 years. When I hit rock bottom and I realized that I had been mobbed several times, once because I reported an affair in the workplace, I got transferred out of the workplace. Once because somebody accused me of reporting them for fraud when they were actually guilty, I ended up getting mobbed. We, as the people who were targeted, usually end up suffering because we do the right thing, because we speak up, because we report abuse, we follow our very own policies. It seemed that the worst times I was ever bullied was when I was at my weakest. I am a strong, tenacious Scots woman, and I will speak my mind and be direct. But when my father died, that's when a really tough group of, of very toxic clique of social workers mobbed me. And then years later, when my mother was dying and died, I was bullied again by another strong group the leader being a psychologist. We don't expect that to happen from psychologists. One of his buddy, 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 bullying buddies was a social worker. I truly believe he was bullying the heck out of her and then she bullied me. Two HR workers and the admin manager, I believe, I call her the silent bully because behind closed doors, she was agreeing with everything he was saying. So she was contributing and maybe she was even giving him some ideas. So she was the silent bully. But the shocker for you will probably be when I tell you the acting supervisor who joined that club of that mobbing group was a pastor. 
she used to be one of my cheerleaders, but as soon as she was put into a role of leadership, she became a bully as well. I noticed a pattern in their tactics. I believe he was teaching them and training them what to do. I saw this people screaming and yelling at me and accusing me of things that I've never thought of, never even entered my mind. But this woman was screaming at me so much she was spitting and her eyes were bugging out of her head. And let me tell you, it was terrifying. It was paralyzing. There was one day that I thought I was actually having a heart attack. I was into this for a year and a half now. And I thought for sure I was having a heart attack. I had chest pains. I had pain going down my arm. Heart attacks are a little bit different for women. I felt it in my throat. I didn't feel right. And I was working in a cancer center and I had a patient to see. And I had to go to my bully boss, the psychologist, and ask for help. I told him my symptoms, my high risk for my family history. It was a Thursday. He turned his back to me and said, I have time on Tuesday. We can talk then. That will tell you how bad it was. He was willing to let me go into an office with a cancer patient, even though I might have been having symptoms of a heart attack. When that cancer patient and I left the office, the entire office was shut down. Lights were out. Doors were locked. They, he left me alone and he made everybody leave. What about that patient? I ended up in the emergency with a, my first ever full-blown panic attack. And that is the worst feeling in the world. It is terrifying. It wasn't my last, but now I knew what my patients were going through or my clients were going through. So how did I survive? Well, I had to hot, hit rock bottom because I was stubborn before I would take sick leave because I thought I could fix it. I thought if I did better, I, would, I, would, I could fix it. If I worked harder, I could fix it. No, you can't. When you've got a target on your back, you cannot fix it. So I ended up getting quite sick, burnt out, PTSD. I had physical problems, long-term permanent disorders because of what I went through in a cancer center. So what I did was I went and I got help. We need to reach out for help. Obviously, as social workers, we feel shame. I felt a lot of shame. And I think a lot of social workers don't come forward because of the shame. We think we should know better. We think we should have seen the signs. But let's be we're human. And all social workers aren't trained equally either. And I was very, very, very worried about people who didn't speak English as a first language. If I nearly died going through this, what about those people? So I decided that I would get a master's degree in this area and I would start an organization and it's been going for 11 years now. I work with the leadership because my perspective is you need to work with all parties. I work with the leadership. I work with the injured employees, the witnesses who struggle, and I even work with the offenders. I work with the politicians. Wherever I see a gap, I go into that gap and I try to address that gap. And that's how I got through it. That's how I got my justice. I didn't get it through fighting the system because nobody else knew. Nobody else was available. We weren't talking about it where I live in Alberta or in Canada. There were no resources. I didn't get my justice. But I decided that I needed my recovery with or without justice. And I hope that you will too. Don't wait for justice to show up for you to take care of yourself and heal the wounds of workplace bullying and harassment. Hello, my name is April Monroe Wood. I am a social worker. I've been in practice with social work for 25 years. For 12 of the 25 years, I worked at a child welfare agency. In 2012, I sat down in front of an executive director after staff had filed a grievance. He listed off a laundry list of horrible characterizations of myself as told to him by staff. Within the span of three minutes, I was told I was not worth fixing and that I wasn't worth his time. Prior to working for this agency, I was deemed a hard worker, kind, considerate, respectful, and thoughtful. I was always the person that persons people went to when they needed something done. I was the person that cared for sick family members. I was the one that went back to the agency after parental leave because they were short staffed. And even after my sister passed, my I went back too early after bereavement leave because again, the agency was short staffed. I was told by my supervisor I was needed back because they had a tough case and I was asked to work my magic. 
When I was promoted to supervisor of the unit, I thought everything was going well until I hired back a former staff member. The unit dynamic shifted at this point. I started hearing comments such as, you're like this because you were trained by her, a former supervisor that was labeled a bully, or you're like this because you worked for the military. And after a while, I started hearing other staff make the same statements to me. My way of dealing with these comments was to try and be a strong and a fair supervisor. So when staff needed lighter caseloads, I advocated for additional staff. When they felt overwhelmed, I helped them with their paperwork. I even organized uh, supervisors to get together once a month so that we can organize for staff, get togethers, Christmas parties, potlucks. And for all my hard work, I received positive annual reviews. But two things changed. One, I took a short sick leave for hip surgery and a temporary su supervisor was put in my place. When I came back, staff told me, why can't you be more like her? She let us do whatever we wanted to do. Except when I returned to the unit, I faced multiple cases that closed too early, families that were in crisis and an angry intake supervisor because her staff had to fix our mistakes. The second thing that happened was that our agency had amalgamated. At our first joint AGM, the executive director made it very clear, staff were to be given more decision-making freedom over their cases. And any supervisor that did not support this change would not be tolerated. A few months later, I approached my director. One of my staff had the ear of the executive director and was telling him that I was being too strict and not flexible enough. My director, being aware of what happened when I was on sick leave, said, don't worry about it. Tension's running high because of the amalgamation and other, other supervisors are also being commented on. When my director retired, things went from bad to worse. When I approach, approached my new director with a staff concern, I was told to meet them one-on-one, -on -one. except when I put out the notice and request to ask to meet with them, no one bothered to answer. They started acting cold and distant. They started closing their doors. During supervision, they wouldn't even look at me. They would always turn their back towards the computer. And when I was appointed a new staff member, I was told I couldn't meet with this staff member because they were scared to meet with me in private and therefore had to have a union rep in, present in order to feel comfortable. By now, I'm a wreck. I'm having trouble sleeping. My heart's pounding out of my chest every day. I'm trying to put my keys in my office door and they're falling down because I'm feeling anxious all the time. I even ended up at the ER thinking I was having a heart attack. When I told my new director that I was feeling so anxious, she didn't bother to respond. She just said, keep working. Within a week, I was notified that a grievance had been laid and the staff had cited a toxic work environment and failure to allow them freedom over their cases. The two things the executor, exec, executive director had stated in the AGM. When I look back at the situation, I was well aware that our office had a toxic work history and that each time a new staff member or return staff member came, this toxic work environment was still spoken about. Staff could not let it go. And so when I had hired this former staff member, I found that this toxic work environment came back into the fold. In the months after the meeting, I took time off to be a mom and a wife. I focused on my family because I felt so humiliated. I couldn't even talk to anybody from work. I spent time in my garden. I started walking and I spent time with friends. I read an awful lot of articles on people let go. I wanted to hear their stories. I wanted to feel less alone. I started thinking about what I wanted to do with my life because I thought, I'm not going to let them get me down. This is not the person I am. This was not the person that they described me to be. I was much more. So I secured myself a clinical position. I worked hard at getting myself retrained. And four years later, I left and started my private practice. And today I focus on individuals that are experiencing psychological harassment and bullying in the workplace. And I always tell them options of what they could do or what they could think about. 
And I find I get great satisfaction out of that because I can then tell a part of my story when I do talk to them. I know there's a lot of things that you can do to document when you're going through. Unfortunately, I wasn't believed about anything that was happening to me. Everything was focused on staff. But if it's helpful to you, please speak up. Don't wait until you're at the ER and feeling like you're having a heart attack to be able to tell your story. It's your story. Uh, my name is Mark Nickel. Um, I earned a BSW and then a master's degree in social work in community development and social planning. I've uh, been a social worker for 40 years working in both government and the not-for-profit sector in Alberta, the Northwest Territories, and in a couple of countries in the Caribbean. I've also been a practicum supervisor for over 30 years. It may well be that part of the reason I didn't experience bullying for many years is of white male privilege. Uh, but it just, you know, hadn't, hadn't really heard of it. But in, in 2010, after about 28 years of practice, uh, been seconded for a number of years and hadn't had a permanent position, which made for uh, ongoing stress because I would have these series of short-term secondments. Finally, a colleague of mine offered me a permanent job and uh, in this large human service organization. Unfortunately, I became the latest target of this serial bully who would pick someone, groom them, overload them, and then when they failed eventually, would be very condescending and demote them or help them find something else. Um, I could see what was going on. Um, I was able to keep up, but I searched for something else. So I escaped when I was offered a job in a new area in the organization, doing some really meaningful work. It was very exciting. The person that hired me was, was, was someone I admired and Unfortunately, within just a few months, I saw this person be bullied and this person literally at a meeting one day start to just melt and, and walked herself out of the meeting and we never saw her again, uh, except to take her for lunch a number of months later. Um, I stepped into that role on an acting basis and then was became part of a senior management team that was being bullied by uh, a new leader. And I watched as one by one, those people left. We, we supported each other, so that was great. But people who had options exercised them and, and left. And I remember one day on a Friday afternoon, a colleague sobbing in their office, um, feeling like she had no options. At that same time, my father was dying. Um, shortly after that, um, the position I was in on an acting basis was filled permanently. Um, the new director came in and didn't talk to me. And uh, my office was next to theirs. But unless I actually stuck my head in the door and said, good morning, they, they would not address me. My colleagues, who I'd, some of whom I'd known for a number of years, did not speak to me. Uh, no one talked to me except one support staff member who uh, said to me quietly, you know, I see what's happening, but I can't see anything because I'm new in this country and I'm afraid they will um, not, you know, give me permanent status. I, I can remember walking by a staff meeting, and this was a team that I had led, and and said, oh, gee, I'm sorry, I didn't know about this. And they said, oh, no worries, you don't need to be here. Uh, communication that I got was condescending emails requiring I do meaning, 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 menial work that wasn't in my job description. At one point, I was instructed not to, to communicate with anyone above my rank. And then when I CC'd a senior person in an email to let them know about a canceled meeting, I was brought in and reprimanded by my boss. About that time, I ended up in emergency, at least on two different occasions, once on a visit to my dying father, and another time at the local university hospital with extreme abdominal pain. I remember them doing all these tests. And I'm like, Don't know. There's no, 
you know, physiological explanation. And he said, well, are you under a lot of stress? And then kind of the light bulb went off. I had a number of periods of medical leave, would attempt to return to work. Uh, rarely worked, I asked for a secondment that was denied. Eventually negotiated a buyout and left. Interestingly, I did a, a freedom of information request, got six inch pile of documents and there was very little uh, of substance in it, except an email from a colleague who described how I had come down to another floor where the rest of the team worked because no one would talk to me. And I'm a pretty social guy and it just, it just was so horrible to be shunned. And uh, that was about the only meaningful thing in this six inch pile of things. Coping during that period of period of bullying, I was finding myself increasingly uh, anxious um, and, and struggling and you know, using alcohol and, and food to, to cope. I was really lucky though. I had an amazing EAP counselor who I speak to every Friday morning at 8 a.m. Never met the person, but was great help. And then a psychologist who I found. And of course, Linda Crockett was a huge help. I uh, met her at a, at a research symposium and she very much helped me um, cope with this. Um, in fact, Linda and I did a workshop for our professional colleagues, uh, a full day workshop in a two day workshop, a two day conference, and it was sold out. And in fact, people crammed in uh, to, to, to hear what we were saying. I had ongoing issues with anxiety for a number of years, but fortunately stumbled across uh, in the Caribbean, someone from Eastern Canada who said, oh, I could do neurofeedback and did a number of sessions with me that made a huge difference in terms of um, my ongoing mental health, et cetera. And that's my story. Lee Donago, Guy Spocky, Shelley Pompana Spear Chief. Um, I'm a clinical social worker from Southern Alberta, and I'm going to share my story. Um, I have numerous stories, but I just picked one. Um, as an Indigenous First Nation person working in a non First Nation institution, I was working as a clinical lead in a large, very large school division that was servicing two of the largest reserves in Canada. And in this position as the clinical lead, my role and responsibilities was to support First Nation, Indigenous, First Nation, Métis, Inuit youth. Um, to be honest, we only had First Nations in our territory, um, maybe some Métis, and their families uh, attending off-reserve schools. Um, when I was first hired, we had a different leadership and it was awesome. It was great. And we were all working towards the same direction. Uh, we were involved in planning and redesigning and implementing a First Nation strategy. And this new leadership had a different plan and was more interested in international students. And in doing that, suddenly there was um, some snide remarks some put downs, um, treated like I didn't know anything, I wasn't intelligent. And at one point I used to be under a min minister, Eleanor Ka uh, Kaplan, if I remember her name correctly, from Ontario. I was one of the health planners, but apparently I didn't know anything as a clinical lead. So very slowly I was getting um, undermined, put down, and then um, so very, um, how would you call that when they pat on your back like now now you're just a you're just a woman you don't know anything and it was the superintendent of this school division and i made it known out of respect don't touch me and then slowly just dismantled everything i did and then in that also there was a clinical indigenous education lead and um slowly started dismantling that person's program. But then in doing that, actually tried to turn the two clinical leads against each other. And I, I'm too old, I wouldn't play those games. But my counterpart was younger and did fall into those games. 
And then also the support staff in the school division, which they only had a handful of indigenous support staff. So they believed they had to play into this game of the new superintendent or they would lose their job, which in fact was very true. In the long run, they did lose their job. I wouldn't back down, but I kept pushing the umbrella that, you know, this is the minister's recommendation. This is what we're here for. And the stress level started just building for me because I'm very passionate about our children and our people. And in that, it just got worse and worse. Um, I started noticing I had somatic body pains. I started noticing a lot of stress levels, um, staff. And to be honest, they were Caucasian staff. And lots and lots, lots and lots of white fragility started to happen within the school systems. So you would suddenly enter in and then all of a sudden, like doors would shut and everybody would disappear except one person, a youth, because she herself was a counselor and she could see the challenges that was happening from these two major reserves. Um, in the end, it was the last day of the school year. And uh, no, it was Christmas time actually. And so it was the last day of that school year. It was just Christmas time. There was a text going on and it was a group text, and it was amongst the Indigenous FNMI staff. But they accidentally sent the text to me as well. And um, I didn't really, I wasn't really concerned because I was flying out to Mexico, but um, they sent it to me. But in there, it said, please, please, please don't tell Shelly because um, we don't want her at the meeting because that superintendent was invited. The, the Christmas party and they didn't want me there um, because they didn't want their jobs to be jeopardized. So it was the clinical lead making it known to another person. So there was my evidence of the bullying. So I thought, okay, what do I do with this? So I went straight in and I addressed it after the holidays with the uh, divisional staff. But it was minimized, dismissed, and it wasn't, uh, they said it wasn't factual. But I knew it was, and just by the fact that I did respond to the text to the, the uh, group and said, you don't have to worry. I wasn't planning on attending the party. I was going elsewhere. What I didn't tell them is I was going actually to Mexico. So um, I have tough shoulders, so I thought, because I've put up with this all my life experiencing somatic body body pains, lots of stress, um, headaches, not sleeping at night, and um, literally just becoming a night owl and working longer and longer. And then the one that did it the most was a family. I was sent into a meeting to address a case that the administrators and the divisional staff had made a precedence on and I guess took a First Nation family to the school board for attendance. And this family had major, major issues going down in it. And I couldn't believe it. I'd known nothing. But I was supposed to go in and address the family and stick to the school policies and not be supportive to the family, but make it clear this is the mandate of the school division and the Ministry of Education. Of course, I couldn't do that. And I told them what they could do and how they could appeal it and they could take their child back to the on-reserve schools. So they didn't like that. But that's the way it rolls. I wasn't willing to back down. So there wasn't much they could do, but on the last day of school, the very last day, that's when they called me down to their offices. And at a table sitting around them, they just sent this piece of paper across the table at me, but they had their eyes down. They couldn't make eye contact. And they kind of slid it across. And then they said, oh, um, open it. So I was demanded to open it. And I said, no, you can tell me what's in it. So they said, no, we want you to open it. And I said, like I said, you can tell me what's in it. And then they said, well, we've restructured your position, so you're no longer going to be needed here. And I just pushed it back across the table, and I said, not likely. 
I said, what we're dealing with here is just a bunch of white fragility. And I got up and walked out. So I said it didn't bother me. But by the time I got back to my office to pack up my stuff, I had a TIA right in my office. So it had been bothering me for a very long time. And then my the one person who was supporting me in the school witnessed it and, and it, it scared this individual. How did I cope? Well, I didn't cope very well. I was uh, dismissing it, sweeping it under the carpet, getting angry for my people. But then in the end, how did I cope? I spoke to our elder and he, he listened, yeah, he listened, but then he kind of minimized it and said, well, just move on. You know what they're like, just move on. I didn't like that answer. Then I went to a, a therapist, um, non-Indigenous therapist, and she actually minimized me. So then, and kind of told me it was all in my head. So then I left that one and I thought, okay, and walked out of there. And then I finally found a third person, and this person actually validated me, heard me, listened to the story, cried, and I couldn't believe they were crying because I still wasn't attuned to what had happened to me because the intensity of the story was heartbreaking to this person that I've been living with stuff like this all my life, but finally you know, here I was sitting in her office and it traumatized her. She called it vicarious traumatization to listen to these nonstop stories of what was happening. And that was the beginning of healing for me. And then of course I did some somatic work, some EMDR and more talking, and then went back at my elder and had a debate with my elder and then educated uh, him a little bit and that sometimes we don't move on we need to advocate and put a stop to this kind of treatment so I guess what I'm encouraging to everybody out there and what I encourage my clients today is get help talk to people keep talking till somebody listens never stop talking because the first few may not listen but keep going uh, make sure that you feel validated and you know in our teachings, this one elder shared with me that this black snake, it's seen the knife as danger. It was a threat. So, of course, as the snake is wrapping around it, it's cutting itself. But it keeps trying to intimidate the knife, squeezing it tighter and tighter and tighter until the snake ultimately killed itself. So, in the end, don't be the snake always go get help and don't see everything as intimidation or fear. Wow, that was powerful, impactful. I mean, real stories from the front lines, from the social workers who take care of us. When we have our issues and we come to them, they too have this uh, workplace ill happening to them. I think, um, I mean, workplace bullying is interpersonal cruelty, and it's not right that our social workers sh should have to deal with that as well. Hi, my name is Joanne Jo Concepcion. I'm the founder of Trail Mobile App, but I'm also a workplace bullying survivor. You just heard from four social workers about their experiences with workplace bullying and harassment. If there's anything we could learn from these stories of survival, it's the importance of documenting your experiences. With the Trail app, you can keep track of bullying, harassment, discrimination, racism, or any unwanted behavior in the workplace, all while monitoring your overall wellness. It's a private, secure place to log your thoughts daily, upload supporting images and documents, and keep track of your mental health with custom emojis. You can then export your report and assess your input, or take it to a legal or medical expert for review. If you're experiencing unwanted behavior, I hope you know that you're not alone and that there's help right at your fingertips. Please visit trailapp.com to download the app and begin storing evidence today. I'm really grateful to my colleagues for coming forward today. It takes a lot of courage and it's hard, but it's so important for us as social workers to start talking about this. We're human too. And my brothers and sisters in social work, we wanted you to hear our stories so that you know that you're not alone. 
And I hope that this makes a difference because we need more social workers coming forward and talking about the prevention and intervention of abuse and repair as well. We want you to remember the moment that you feel something is not right to start documenting. And I am going to say again that Joy Angel's app, Trail mobile app, is fantastic and very efficient. I promote it because I believe in it. Documentation is not only to prove that you're credible and and that you're so that your interview or your oh my god. Documentation is not only important for the investigation that might happen. Someday you may be accused. You never know. More false allegations are coming forward. So document to save yourself, but also document for your mental health because you're going to need that clarity that documentation is bringing you. And you're going to need that confidence that documentation gives you. And then you're going to need the courage that that confidence and that clarity gives you so that you can make a complaint because we need to speak up about it and we need to make a difference. The most important takeaway that I hope you heard here from all of us today is to talk about it. Find a way to tell your story. Even if it's writing, art, singing a song, find a way to get it out of your body because it will make you sick. It makes us sick. We're here to tell you about it. Find your way.